Islamic calendar. And it's one of the four sacred months that Allah Azza wa mentioned. And it's also one of the three months of Al-Hajj that were mentioned in the Quran. And the Nabi said about these days, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sallam, Ma Min Ayamin Al Amru Salihu Fihinna Ahabu Allahi Min Hadihi Al Ayam. قال الناس ولا الجهاد في سبيل الله يا رسول الله قال صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم ولا الجهاد في سبيل الله إلا الرجل خرج بنفسه وماله ثم لم يرجع من ذلك بشيء. He said that these days are the days in which the deeds and the actions that are done in these days they're the most beloved days to Allah عز وجل. So there are no other days during the course of the year that are better than these particular days. And when the companions heard that, they said, what about a person who performs al-jihad in other than these days? So if a person were to perform al-jihad, the real jihad of Islam, the real one, in the month of Ramadan, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam said that these days are better than the jihad in the month of Ramadan or any other month. So the dhikr of Allah during these days, the salat during these days, the sadaqah that a person do, does during these days, the fast that he does during these days, the birr walidain during these days are better than performing al-jihad fi sabirillah in the month of Ramadan, for an example, with the exception of the individual who performs a jihad in another month outside of these 10 days and he were to get the shahada. If he were to get the shahada in other days, then obviously the hadith clearly indicates that he would be better and the jihad with shahada outside of these days would be better. So these are the days in which the ibadat of al-Islam and the efforts of any individual, they are magnified and they are more significant than the other days during, our, during the course of the year. And that's part of what we believe in in our aqidah, that Allah Azza wa Jal, He chooses what He wants to choose. He raises up people who He wants to make them better than others. He raises up a people's tribe and He puts them over other tribes like Quraysh. He, Tabarak Ta'ala, makes the masjid in Mecca and then the one in Medina and then the one in Bayt al-Maqdas better than any other masjid. He makes Yawm al the best day during the course of the week. He made Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the best prophet and the messenger. Allah Azza wa made the Quran superior to the other books that he revealed and so forth and so on. So the days that we're in are in the best, they are the best days throughout the course of the whole year. So we're winding up this year in the Islamic calendar. So these days are the best days. From what shows and proves the virtues of these days, it's the fact that Allah Azza wa Jalla swore by these days when He said, "Wal Fajr, Wal Ayal, Wal Ayal Ash, Wal Shafi, Wal Wat." He swore by the Fajr time, and He swore by the ten days. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, radhi Allahu anhu. He said that the meaning of the 10 days in this ayat that Allah Azza wa Jalla is swearing by are the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, the ones that we're in right now. So the fact that Allah Azza wa Jalla swore by these days shows its significance because Allah never swears by anything in the Quran except that it's important. He swore by the Fajr, He swore by the Duha, He swore by the Shams, and He swore by Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala in two ayahs of the Quran. So everything that Allah swears by, it is important. But it's important for us to understand as well that if Allah swears and he makes al-qasm, he can swear by whatever he wants to swear by. So he can swear by his creation if he wants to because he does what he wants to do. As for us, Abu Huraira, the companion, he said for me to swear by Allah and I'm lying, I say, Wallahi, and I'm lying, he said that is more beloved to me, is more preferable to me than to swear by other than Allah. If a person says, Wallahi, and he is lying, 
then this is a kabira from the kabair. But if he swears by other than Allah, then he is committing shirk. So Abu Huraira's statement was not and should not be understood that he's saying it's okay to swear by other than Allah, to swear by Allah lying. What he's saying is swearing by Allah and a person's not being truthful is a major sin. But it's preferable to him to do that major sin than it is for him to make shirk with Allah by swearing by his father, by swearing on his grandfather, by swearing by the Kaaba or other than that. From what shows the virtues of these 10 days is what Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Hajj in ayat number 28. He commanded, let them remember the name of Allah in the well-known days. Ayam ma'lumat. That command, let the Muslims remember Allah in the days that are well known. Again, Abdullah ibn Abbasin radiallahu anhu, he said that this ayat is referring to the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Let them remember Allah in these 10 days. Allah Ta'ala also mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah, Al Hajj, Ashurum ma'lumat. The Hajj are well known months. The Hajj, the time when a person can perform the Hajj, is in the well known months. The first one is Shawwal. After we complete the fast of Ramadan, if a person has money and he wants to go to Mecca and he wants to form, perform the Hajj of a Tamattu', he can perform the Hajj of a Tamattu' by going to Mecca and he performs Umrah. And then he comes out of his Umrah. And he waits for the day of a tarwiyah in these days. He waits for the day of a tarwiyah in these days. So shawal, a person can begin the process of performing hajj. And then the month that comes after that, dhul qidah, which was last month. And then this month, dhul hijjah. So Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentioned that the months of al-hajj are well known. And this is the month of al-hajj. So it was mentioned in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Concerning the issue, ikhwani, of these days, we should know being that this is a masjid that uh, is called Alul Hadith, and all of us, we want to be of the people of Alul Hadith. We want to be from the people of the Sunnah. We want to be correct Muslims. And we should know that the people of the past... They used to make a lot of efforts during these days and they obviously were trying to do more from the companions. May Allah be pleased with all of them and then the tabi'een and then the followers of the tabi'een after them and then the imma of al-Islam. So it's from the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to try to increase our activities during these days. And one of the reasons why these days are the best days in Al-Islam. They are the best days, these 10 days, is that these are the only days in which all of the ibadat of Al-Islam are being practiced from the arkan of Al-Islam. The ummu, ummuhat al-ibadat, the main forms of worship, they're all being done in these 10 days. Whereas in other days, that's not the case. So obviously the shahadatain, the Muslim is going to do that all year long. Concerning the salat, the Muslim is going to do that all year long. Concerning the zakat, the zakat, he's not going to do that all year long. But this is one of the months if a person became a Muslim, he can perform his zakat during this month. He came into Islam during this time, so he pays his zakat during these days. There are people who their zakat is wajib upon them during these days, these days. The sister who we just prayed for, she was a revert sister who died recently. May Allah, the Prophet was upon, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, there's no difference from what this Prophet is speaking about and what we believe. So he said, you have my protection and you can stay in my land. You people, you have to go back. And they went back. And then the Muslims heard that the non-Muslims of Mecca Stop persecuting the Meccan Muslims. So they left Ethiopia and they went to Mecca only to find that it wasn't true. They were still persecuting people and killing people. And then the second hijra was legislated and they made the second hijra from Mecca to Al Medina. 
So there were some companions who performed hijra two times during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. min al-kalam kullihi is that the point is that that Najashi, when he died, Jibril came and told the Prophet that he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet prayed salatul janaza over him. And he described that he has a castle in Jannah and that he was from the people of Jannah. So we consider the Najashi to be a companion. And when we hear his name, we say, Radi Allahu anhu. So the point here, Ikhwani, is that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed over the Najashi because no one prayed over him. That's what we have. So one of the things that we're not easy with, we're not comfortable with, is what happens in our masjid here, another Alul Hadith masjid, and it's a common practice amongst the Asian community that should be rejected and avoided because it opens up the door for social hypocrisy. Whenever an Asian person dies in Kashmir, in Mirpur, in India, in Afghanistan, if someone who's connected to the Asian community dies, they get prayed on over there in Lahore. And then the people here who know them, we pray over them again. And we say this is in contradiction of the Sunnah. And not only that, if we were to do that and we opened up the door for that, then okay, you have to let everybody do it. So our brother who has a relative who's in Mugadishu, he comes and says, my relative was killed in Mugadishu. My relative died in Mugadishu. Let's pray Salatu Janaz al ghaib We should say, okay. And then the other one comes and said, my relative in Kismayo, he died yesterday. Okay. And then the other one comes and says, okay, my relative in Basaso, he died. Okay. My relative in Peking, China. Okay. And, and on and on and on. And every day after every Salat, we have this Salat al ghaib Now, if the African person comes and says, hey, my relative, he died and he's in somewhere in... Uh, you, Rwanda, he died. He was killed in Rwanda. He died. We're going to say, hey, hey, we're not going to let you. And we say, hey, what's, what's that all about? We have to be even for everybody. So we say, close the door. But there was a lady in Sayyid al-Bukhari who used to clean the masjid. And when the Prophet wasallam saw that she went missing, she asked the people, where is that lady? They said, she died last night, Ya Rasulullah. And we prayed janazah over her. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay, come with me. And they went with him to the Baqir, where the graveyard was, and he prayed over her in Jama'at. So the people who say that it's permissible to pray Salat al-Ghaib, that's one of the delils that they use. And I respect that delil because you can't deny that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed over that lady, the companions one night, and now the Nabi prayed over her again. The scholar said, no, this thing was special for that lady because of her position. As if, no, they didn't miss a beat. That's how it is. I just want to make this point about this. I got to move on. This is one of the many proofs that some brothers have who are preoccupied with Afrocentrism. And that is this concept that some people of color, black people who are reverts and so forth and so on, they want to use reverse racism and they have problems with hadith like this or they big up hadith like this. You see how the Prophet Sallallahu prayed over the black woman? That goes to show black people have a special place. Or some a hadith will be mentioned about a black person here or there and it may be negative, it may be positive. When it's positive in their opinion, they build it up. When it's negative in their opinion, they reject it even if it's in Bukhari and Muslim. In our religion, we don't have this type of nonsense. Afrocentrism, if it means, if it means, I'm a Muslim and I'm proud of where I came from. I'm not a Pakistani. I'm not Asian. I'm not an Arab. I'm not white. I am who I am. If it means that, then everyone has the right to be happy where he came from because Allah knew what he was doing when he created everybody. But he has to understand as Allah mentioned, the best of you in Allah's sight is the one who has the most taqwa. There are people who are from Quraysh and they're in the hellfire like Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, Umayy ibn Khalif, and Bilal ibn Rabah is better than them. Not only is Bilal ibn Rabah better than them, but everyone sitting here who says La ilaha illallah is better than that individual, although his lineage is from the highest lineage 
that Al Islam has made, that Allah made and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recognized and acknowledged. So we ask Allah to have mercy upon that lady and to help her family who have been remained behind concerning that issue. But praying Salatul Janazah over the lady is from the best deeds that we can possibly do in El Islam because it was done in these particular days. So concerning the Ummahat of the Ibadat, we're going to do Zakat in these days. We're going to fast in these days, as you're going to see, inshallah, because the Prophet, وسلم, as some of his wives mentioned, he used to fast 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. So these are the days in which Psalm is, and obviously these are the days of Al Hajj. So they're the best days in Al Islam because the five arkan of Al Islam are being done in these particular days. As it relates to what should be done during these days, then obviously we're not going to deal with what the pilgrims do because they're going to do a lot of things that we don't have the ability to do based upon and on the strength of they're in Mecca. And there are things in Mecca that are not here, obviously, like making tawaf around the Kaaba, like kissing the black stone, like drinking zamzam water, like making a sa'i between a safa and marwa. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it possible for you brothers to go and perform Hajj or Umrah so that you can at least have an idea of what I'm even talking about. Many of you are sitting there and we say, go and make Sa'i between Saf and Marwa. You have no idea. You have the faintest idea of what that means because you've never been there. But there are people who have been there outside of Ramadan, in Ramadan, and people have been there during the course of the year. And some people have been there for Hajj, so they know at least what I'm talking about. How many of you have not performed Umrah or Hajj? Put your hand up. How many of you have performed Umrah, Hajj? Put your hand up. How many of you perform Hajj? And how many of you perform Umrah? Okay, mashallah. Those of you who perform Umrah but not Hajj, put your hand up. If you perform Umrah and not Hajj. Well, the point here is those people are in a position to do things that we are not able to do and their case is better than ours. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Hajj wa Mu'tamar waftullah. Those people who perform Hajj or Umrah, they are the delegation of Allah. Allah invited them to come and they listened to his invitation. They went, so they're going to be forgiven and they're going to have Al-Jannah. Today it was a nice day outside. There was some ambiance outside. I don't know what it was. But around Asr time, it's a nice day outside in these days. And that's because, as we mentioned, the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he kana yasum tis'a al-ashr. Oh, tis'a dhul hijjah. He used to fast nine days of dhul hijjah. He used to fast nine days of dhul hijjah. He didn't fast the tenth day because the tenth day is the Eid. And it's not permissible to fast on the day of the Eid. It's haram. Anyone who's fasting on the day of the Eid is making a grave error. So he used to fast every single day. So if an individual wants to fast, then he can do so. As for the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تسوموا يوم السبت إلا في مفترد عليكم Don't fast on a Saturday except the one that is wajib. So in Ramadan, you fast on Saturday. If you're going to make up your days that you missed in Ramadan, you can fast that day on Saturday. If an individual made an oath and he's going to fast, he can fast on Saturday. If a person decides to fast on Friday, he has to fast Thursday before that Friday or the Saturday after that. So if you fast on Friday and he missed Thursday, Saturday is wajib because you shouldn't choose you shouldn't choose Friday alone. You have to fast the day before or day after. But because of that hadith, don't fast on Saturday except in what is wajid. Some of the ulama took the opinion, even if Arafat came on Saturday, don't fast. They were of the opinion that even if Ashura came on Saturday, don't fast. But concerning this month, these days of Dhul Hijjah, the Nabi, he fasted nine days according to his wives, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So obviously included in that is the Saturday. So that's 
Mustefnia, it is an exception of that general rule who, for the people who take that position. Again, Ikhwani, and being fair and just, there are some scholars who said, no, no, you can fast on Saturday. They don't acknowledge that hadith, but this is what knowledge is all about, that everyone does an effort to try to figure out what is the truth, and he takes his position and he keeps it moving after he takes his position, and we learn how to have the adab of al ikhtilaf between ourselves. So fasting is from what should be done. Secondly, making as much dhikr of Allah Azza wa as possible, whether that dhikr is after the five prayers, or whether that dhikr is just reading the Quran, or whether that dhikr is just increasing different things that a person says, then that should be increased during these months. As the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, when he mentioned about these illustrious days, he said, فَأَكْثِرُ فِيهِنَّ مِنَ التَّهْلِيلِ وَالتَّكْبِيرِ وَالتَّحْمِيدِ He said that these days are the best days of the good deeds, and Allah loves these days, so therefore increase your dhikr of Allah by saying, La ilaha illallah more, by saying, Alhamdulillah more, and by saying, Allahu Akbar. And also, as we mentioned in the ayat, وَيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي عَيَامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ Allah commanded in that ayat of Surah Al-Hajj, let them remember Allah in the well-known days. So Allah commanded it, and the Prophet showed us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From what should be done by the people who didn't perform hajjs, they should, if they have the ability, slaughter an animal, and the dhabiha is from the best ibadat in Al-Islam. The udhiyah, or slaughtering for the Eid, for the Eid dates, from the best ibadat in Al-Islam. And on the day of slaughtering, again, it is the ninth, the tenth day, and that's from these ten days, and actually, Akhwani, the tenth day is the best day out of the ten. The tenth day is better than the nine previous days. And we know that from the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best days to Allah Azza wa Jal is the day of slaughtering. It is the a'zam al-ayam in the dunya. So if someone were to ask you, what are the best days in the dunya? The best days of the ten, dunya are those ten of Dhul Hijjah. And what are the come to the eight praise, making a bigger sin, another sin? The kalam of the Nabi here is a zajr trying to frighten the people to show the importance of slaughtering is similar to eating onions, eating garlic. He said, من أكلا من هاتيني الشجرتيني الخبيثتيني فلا يقربن مسجدنا Anyone who eats from these two filthy trees don't come to our masjid. No, you have to still pray. But he made that statement, that warning to catch the people's attention, to say, don't eat something like that before you come to make the salat. Don't do that. So from that, it's understood that it is wajib. Another proof that the scholars use to show that it's wajib is the fact that there was a man who slaughtered before the salat of al eid He came up to that, he came to that conclusion on himself, by himself, he slaughtered before the salat. When he told the Prophet what happened, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet told him, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi taslimin kathira. Shatuka shatu lahmin. That thing you just slaughtered is just meat for your family. Do it again. Do it again. If it wasn't wajib, he wouldn't have ordered the man to do it again. Especially in light of the fact that Islam came to make things easy. But because he did it at the wrong time, it's like salat. Someone prays salat of al asr before his time. And he comes and says, I had sincere niyat, and I was just trying to catch, you know, save time. You're going to tell him, do it again, because it's wajib, and it's still in your neck. You're still responsible for it. So that's the position that those scholars took concerning that particular issue. From them, al-Imam al-Thawri, Sufyan al-Thawri. From them, al-Imam al-Uzai. From them, al-Imam al-Layth ibn Sa'd. From them, al-Imam Abu Hanifa and his two illustrious students, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani and Abu Yusuf, rahimahumullah ta'ala, as well as al-Imam Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahumullah ta'ala. But as I mentioned, Khwani, there's the other position, that the scholars said, no, it's the sunnah. And the reason why they said that 
is because there is an authentic hadith where the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Ida dakhalat al ashru wa arada ahaduk min yudahya, fala yamissu min sha'rihi wa basharihi shay'a. He said, If the ten days come and one of you wants to slaughter, if the ten days come and one of you he wants to slaughter, then let him not trim anything from his nails or his hair. Let him not take anything from his skin, from his nail, from his hair. So those scholars said, since the Prophet ﷺ left it up to the individual, and he said, if you want to, as if there's a choice. So we have to be fair and we have to be just in issues like this. And all it calls for is the etiquette of al ikhtilaf Just like Ramadan, when a person is musafir, half of us are fasting, the other half of us are not fasting. These people shouldn't criticize those, and these shouldn't criticize those. He came down because there was no member. It's outside. He came down. He slaughtered the ram. Before slaughtering the ram, he said, Bismillah, Wallahu Akbar, Hada Anni, Wa Amman Lam Yudahi Min Ummati. He said, Bismillah, and Allah is the greatest. I'm slaughtering this ram on my behalf and on behalf of anyone who didn't slaughter. For my ummah. So that's the rahmah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on us. That if a person doesn't slaughter this year, you have to always remember the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he slaughtered on your behalf. Wa sadaq Allahu Ta'ala when he mentioned in the Quran the end of Surah Tawbah, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنَ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِمَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ So the Nabi he had mercy upon us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the point is here, it's better if you have that ability. And concerning the slaughtering, all you have to do is just slaughter one ram on behalf of your household, and that's it. And from what the salaf used to do concerning this slaughtering, is some of them would make sure that they ate some of the meat and saved it for their family. And some of them would send some to their friends and relatives. And some of them would take another third of that meat and they would give it to the fuqara, the masakin, the muhtajun. But if you wanted to keep all of that ram for yourself, whatever you slaughter, for bihi wa ni'mah. You don't have to give it to anybody. You, are, you and your family have more right to that meat than anybody else. But that's what some of them used to do. About the uthiyah, if we know, we'll say. If we don't know, we'll guide you to where you can get it. Do you brothers have any questions? Akhuna, tafaddal. We don't find concerning this issue swearing by the Quran. We don't find the companions doing this. We don't find the tabi'een doing this. And we don't find the followers of the tabi'een doing this. We don't find the imma of al-Islam doing this. But because the Quran is the kalam of Allah, and it is a characteristic from his characteristics. The Quran is the kalam of Allah. From him it came down and to him is going to return. And the aqid of Ahl Sunnah in all of the books that the ulama of the Sunnah wrote. As-Sulu Sunnah by Imam Ahmed. Sharh Sunnah by Imam al-Barbahari. Kitab Sunnah by Abdullah ibn Ahmed. All of those books. Al-Lalaka'i's book, Shar, Aqid Ta'imma Ahli Sunnah. All of those books, Asul Sunnah to Al-Humaydi, Kitab Sunnah by Ibn Al-Khalal. All of those books without any exception, not one exception, they always bring from the Asul of the Sunnah is that the Muslim has to believe that the Quran is the Kalam of Allah. And Allah's Kalam is a Sifa from his Sifat. He talks when he wants to talk, how he wants to talk, and we don't know the reality. So since it's a characteristic of his characteristics, the scholar said it's permissible to swear by the Quran. To swear by the Quran. Put your hand on the Quran, to swear by the Quran. But your niyat has to be the speech of Allah, the speech of Allah, and not the pages, and not the ink, and not the ghilaf. But it's something that the companions didn't do, so it's better to be avoided. And why not avoid it when you could just say, Wallahi, Tallahi, Billahi.
But a person may be put in that position in this country, he says in the courtroom, I don't want to swear by the Bible. Bring me the Quran. So he does it like that because he's compelled, because he doesn't want to cause problems. And Allah, my Lord, is a'la and a'la. Akhi, kaleem. From the things that should be done during these days, as we mentioned, is the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. People who are performing the Hajj obviously are going to do the talbiya. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. They're going to be doing that type of dhikr. They're going to be doing the bake, Allahumma la bake, la bake, la sharika, la la bake, and alhamda. All the way to the end. So this Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, it should be done on the day of the Eid and it should be continued for three days. The days of a tashriq. The days of a tashriq. Because this Eid is unlike the Eid of Al-Fitr. Eid Al-Fitr from Ramadan is one day, khalas, finish. You can fast the next day. But for this Eid, it is three days. So you can't fast during any of those days, as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali have al Hajj? Does this baby have the Hajj? Can I make Hajj with this baby? He said, Nam, Walaki al Ajr, and you'll get the reward. So that helps us understand that that child has to perform Hajj later on. Because of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rufi al-Qalamu an thalath. The pen has been lifted off of three people. And the sabi hatta yahtalam. It is lifted off of the child until he becomes balig. He becomes mature. So if an individual becomes mature, the boy, the girl start to develop hair. All of the signs of maturity, puberty here, starts to develop and they start to do and see things. Then at that time, if they perform the Hajj 15, 16, when they are balik, whatever their case is, 13, 14, they're balik, they know what's going on, they perform Hajj, irregardless of who paid for that Hajj. If they perform the Hajj, khalas, the obligation of Al Hajj has been lifted off of them and the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنَ اسْتَطَاعِ إِلَيْهِ السَّبِيلَ It has, he's satisfied the responsibility. But there's no problem that he tries to do it again. The more hajj the individual does, the better it is for him, inshallah. Any more questions, ikhwani? Tafadda akhi. Kapsalam. Okay. Yes, for the person who's performing hajj, if he doesn't have the money and he's performing the Hajj of Al-Tamattu' or the Hajj of Al-Qur'an, then he has to fast three days in Al-Hajj and seven days when he gets back from Al-Hajj. So you can fast if you're over there. As for people who are here, we told you that the Prophet Sallallahu his wives mentioned, some of his wives, that he used to fast nine days of dhul hijjah So if he wants to fast all of these days, for bihi wa ni'mah. He wants to follow fast three, two, one. He doesn't want to fast any of them. It's up to him. Their discretion. Ahi Umar from Gambia. So in the hadith that you shouldn't fast on Saturday alone, there are some scholars who said that it was weak. There are some ulama who graded this hadith as being weak, and that's the opinion, inshallah, as we jal. And then there are those who said that it was authentic, and it appears to be authentic. So you, you, and I, we're responsible for doing the best that we can possibly do. Person who doesn't have any background knowledge about hadith, science of hadith, he may look at the issue and he says, who said it's authentic? Who said that it's weak? And based upon the personality of what he heard, because he has no other way of judging. 
He may say, I'm going to follow that opinion or that opinion. Or the individual may take the principle, may take the principle. If you're not sure about something, it could be yes, it could be no. Then whenever you come to something like that and it's hard for you to tell, then it's better to avoid that thing altogether. That's a principle in Islam, a qa'id in Islam. Da'ma yuribuka ila ma la yuribuka. In the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi we explain to you that these hadith are from the Jawami' al kalim they're not any hadith, the 50 hadith of that book. Those hadith are special hadith. And many of them represent principles in Al-Islam. The halal is clear, the haram is clear, and between the two is the gray area. Whoever avoids the gray area, he protected his deen and his honor. So leave what you doubt for what you don't doubt. So if someone comes to an issue, and there are many issues in Islam. One hadith said that the man can kiss his wife while he's fasting. The other hadith said, no, he can't kiss his wife. So which one? I have no background knowledge of how to deal with the issue. I did my best. I don't want to base it judged upon personalities. I don't know. So I'm going to leave it alone. There's a hadith that says, whoever touches his private part, it breaks his wudu. Another hadith said, you're private of that particular issue. Just leave it and you won't have to deal with it at all. But if a person approaches it, and he did his level best. He really was mujarrat. He made tajreed. He really put himself in a position to try to get the correct position without following his desires. He read what they said, and he read what they said. So what did he do? He followed one of the two positions. And that was it. And that's what the scholars used to do at Hwani. And that's why in the past, you will find the scholars having two opinions. Because they would say this, yes, now, and then change their mind and take another position later on. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Any more questions, Khwani? Yes, it's more authentic. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. If the Friday falls in the middle of the month, it is through necessity that Thursday is going to be included in there, or Saturday. Friday is not going to come up by itself. Thursday is going to be there, Saturday is going to be there. Thursday or Saturday. Either this or either that. And if a person is a faster, he's really into fasting for whatever reason. He loves that ibadah from the ibadat. He's young and he's trying to kill that shahwa that is the remedy. Fasting is the remedy to kill it. Whatever. Then you should try to learn about those issues, and that stuff is written in the internet. That stuff is written in the internet. Any more questions? Fadl. After Muharram, can you go Hajj? No, no. This is the only time for Hajj. It's just like um, it's just like uh, Salat. That Allah Ta'ala mentioned about it. In the salah, kana ta'ala al-mu'minina kitab mawquta. Salat is at prescribed times. Allah said, in the ayat that we mentioned earlier, ashhurul, ashhurul, ashhurul al-hajju, ashhurul ma'lumat. The hajj are well-known months. So you can't perform hajj outside of these months. But it's a good question because... Some people, they perform a pilgrimage to Iran to go visit the graves of some of the imams. And some people form, perform what is like a pilgrimage to Bangladesh for Jamaat Tabliq who go at the Ijtima. And some people put more emphasis on that thing than they do on the Hajj. But the Hajj of Al-Islam is only during this time. Any more questions, Akhwani? Uh, 
No zakatul fitr. That's just in Ramadan. That's it. Musawwir. You have a question? It's a good question. Some of the scholars at Khwani, they said that these days are the best days and nights. Point blank. Because of the ayah, wal fajr, wal layal and ash, and the ten nights. Abdullah ibn Abbas said that includes, that's the, the days. So they said that it's, these nights and days are better. Other scholars said, no, these days are better and the nights of Ramadan are better. And that seems to be the strongest opinion. Laylatul Qadr is the best night. Al-Itlaq. And Allah knows best. Any more questions? Okay, two points, Ikhwani, before you go real quick. Two points. Point number one, if it turns out that some of our relatives and our masajid are saying that the Eid is on Wednesday or even Thursday. Some of these people go over. If a person falls into an innovation, just because you fall into an innovation, it doesn't make you an innovator just like that. If a person falls into shirk, it doesn't make you a mushrik. So to prove that point, as a warning, to those people who give wholesale tabdir and takfir, someone who does something, a kufr, we have some Muslims who just say he's a kafir, just like that. No, the companions fell into things that were kufr during the time of the Prophet as we mentioned. As we mentioned. And in the recording that they brought, in the recording that they brought, this statement was given an example. Kufr is bigger than bid'a. Kufr is bigger than bid'a. Bida. So I gave an example of how if a person falls into kufr, he doesn't become a kafir because the companions, they used to swear by their fathers during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The companions used to say it rained because of this star, that star. And then the Nabi would hear it and he'd say, don't say that, that's shirk. That's shirk, don't say that. So the companions did different things that when the Prophet heard the kufr that they fell into, he would say, don't say that, and he rectified it. Now someone comes and say, Abu Sama said that the companions were kuffar. I never said that. I said the companions fell into kufr by the Lord of the Kaaba, by the Lord of the Kaaba. For this reason, ignorance, whatever, but the Prophet rectified it, sallallahu alayhi wa And then I gave the example of innovation. They only brought innovation as an example. If they were sincere, they would have brought that. I said that the companions fell into innovation. But the prophet knew about it and he said, don't do that. I never said that the companions were innovators. They fell into innovations. Meaning, 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 things that are innovation in the religion because they go against the sunnah. That one said, I'm going to pray all day. That one said, I'm going to not get married. That one over there said that I'm going to fast all the time. That one over there was standing in the sun and he took an oath not to speak and to stand up in the sun, not to get in the shade. And when the prophet heard about those things, the legislation was coming down at that time and he rectified it. And that's the point that I was trying to make. So there's a responsibility that the speaker has, no doubt. There's a responsibility that the speaker has to be careful of what he says and how he says it so that he won't open up the door to be blamed. But the listener has a responsibility as well to be sincere. So we both have a responsibility. I'm responsible and I'm going to take responsibility and I ask Allah to protect me from articulating things in the way that's not the best way. It's not the best way. And that's why I'm dealing with this now. Because as you know, inshallah, I've been here eight years. Anytime someone brings something to me, you said this, you said that, and the delil is out, I'm going to clarify. When did you ever hear those people ever clarify one thing? One thing. Is it an indication that they're always true? They never make mistakes? Is that what it means? Does, is that what it means? So the other thing is, is that what it means? They never make a mistake. The other thing, Ikhwani, is, as I just mentioned to you, two scholar, the scholars in the past would take position and they would change their position. They said something, and then they will rectify that position. So it was honorable if a person says something that was really wrong and